Hello everybody, in this short lesson, we will study electric fields. Now in our agenda today, we will begin naturally by explaining the concept of electric fields, more particularly why they are important and what really are they. Um, it, I, I, will, I will tell you that it's quite different from what you normally know about forces. Um, we will look at how to represent electric fields. Um, then we will move forward to how to calculate the electric fields due to several point charges. Now, anything that has a charge or any charge particle generates or creates an electric field. Now, in this particular section of the lesson, we will actually, I will actually show you how to calculate the electric field due to several charges. Now, in order for us to do so, we will employ the principle of superposition to calculate the electric field at a given point in space due to several charges. Now, um, what really is an electric field? Now, suppose we have a charged particle. So, let me ask you this question. What is an electric field? This is a very important question. Now, in order for you to really grapple with the concepts in this chapter, you really have to understand the meaning of the phrase electric fields. An electric charge basically is an intrinsic property of nature that gives an object the ability to attract other objects around itself. Naturally, every form of matter, anything that you can see, feel, and touch, is made up of atoms. And these atoms contain electrons, protons, and neutrons. Now, electrons orbit the nucleus, and the nucleus consists of protons and neutrons. Now, protons naturally are positively charged, while electrons are negatively charged. So, naturally, it means that we are all made up of a bunch of charges. But the question is, how do or how can a charged particle exert a force on another charged particle not in contact with that charged particle. Take for example, we have a charge here, positive Q, and another charge here, positive Q. Normally, we know that this charge is going to be repelled because they are of the same sign. But why? The simple explanation is this. The first charge creates an electric field around itself. Now, because the second charge is in the electric field of the first charge, it will experience an electric force. So, we could therefore conclude that Charges really do not exert forces directly on other charges. They do so through an intervening medium. They generate or create an electric charge, sorry, they generate or create an electric field, which in turn act on other charges placed on it. So, to give you the definition of an electric field, an electric field one can be defined as the region of space 
around an electric charge that asserts a force on any charged particle placed in it. In other words, it is the region of space around a charged particle in which any other charged particle experience a force when placed in that region. Now, the second point you need to take note is that electric fields are vector fields. Now, the reason electric fields are vector fields is because one, electric field has a magnitude And two, electric fields at any given point in space has a direction. Now we will talk about both the magnitude and both the direction of an electric field and how we can actually determine that. So how really can we represent an electric field? I must say that Anything that can be used to represent an electric field must be in such a way that it will show us the magnitude and the direction of the field at that given point in space. Naturally, electric fields are vectors. And we know that a vector generally is represented by an arrow. Now, the direction of the arrow tells us the direction of the field at a given point in space, and the length of the arrow gives us an idea about the magnitude of the field at that particular point in space. But keep in mind that there are two ways in which we can represent an electric field. We could either use the vector field representation or we could use the field line representation. Now, the field line representation is a bit older than the vector field representation. If you open to most textbooks, you except for very current or very recent textbooks, most will use the field line notation to represent electric fields. Now, for the field line representation, the electric field at a given point in space is represented by an arrow. The direction of the arrow signifies the direction of the field at that particular point in space. Now, the length of the arrow is proportional to the magnitude of the electric field at that particular point in space. So keep in mind, using the vector field representation, at any point in space, the electric field is represented with the use of an arrow, whose direction represents the direction of the electric field at that particular point, as well as the length of the arrow is proportional to the magnitude of the field at that point in space. Now, <clears throat> this diagram shows a positive charge. At every point around this charge is an arrow. The arrow tells us about the electric field at that particular point around the charged particle. The direction of the arrow signifies the direction of the field at that particular point. Now, it is worthwhile for you to understand that the direction of an electric field at a given point in space is taken to be the direction in which a positive test charge would move 
if placed at that point. Let me say that again. The direction of an electric field at a given point in space is the direction in which a positive test charge will move when placed at that given point. We know that a positive test charge will move away from a positive charge and will be attracted to or move into a negative charge. This means that electric field lines will always point away from a positive charge and will point into a negative charge. This explains why all the arrows in this diagram are pointing away from the positive charge. But if we move on to a negative charge, you will see that the arrows are pointing into the negative charge. Now, if you look at a dipole here, the arrows are pointing from positive to negative, positive to negative, positive to negative. Now, this is the electric field around an electric dipole. This representation is what we call the vector field representation. Now, if you look at the field line representation, you see that the arrows are continuous. They are not short and this, they are continuous and the point away from a positive charge and the point into a negative charge. Now, electric field lines possess some properties and it is important you understand these properties of electric field lines in order for you to be able to represent electric fields correctly. The very first point is the direction of an electric field vector at any point in space is always tangent to an electric field line at that particular point. Secondly, the number of field lines per unit area through any surface perpendicular to that line is proportional to the magnitude of the electric field at that given point in space. So the point where the lines are closer together, it indicates that the field is strong and the point where the lines are further apart, it indicates that the field is weak. Now, thirdly, electric field lines begin on a positive charge and terminate either at infinity or on a negative charge. Let me say that again. Field lines begin on a positive charge or infinity and terminate on a negative charge or infinity. Lastly, the number of lines that originate from a positive charge or terminate on a negative charge is proportional to the magnitude of the charge. Let me say that again. The number of lines that leave or terminate on a given charge particle is proportional to the size of that particular charge, meaning that the bigger the charge, the more the greater the number of lines that either terminate on that charge if it's negative or emanate or leave that charge if it is positive. And lastly, no two field lines can ever cross each other. If two field lines cross each other at a given point in space, it indicates that the field at that particular point has two different directions which is not possible. The field at a given point has only one direction. If you look at this diagram, this is a, an electric dipole. It's a positive positive, the field lines. And this is positive negative. You see that the field lines here repel each other. This point here is the neutral point where the electric field is zero. Now, if you have a positive and a negative, you see that the field lines leave a positive charge and terminate on the negative charge. And this is really an important diagram. Now, we've talked about the direction of an electric field. 
Now, electric fields are vectors, meaning that it has a magnitude and a direction. Now, the magnitude of the electric field at a given point in space is defined as, is, is measured by the force experienced by a unit test charge at that given point in space. For example, if we have a charged particle right here, let me start first by doing a coordinate system. This is the origin. Let's say we have a charged particle here plus Q. And another charged particle at this point plus small Q. The position vector here is R. And let the position vector there be RP. Therefore, the position vector from here to here, this is R1P. This charged particle will experience a force, F, pointing in that direction. Now, the electric field at that given point in space E, is defined as the limit of F divided by Q as Q turns to zero. As Q turns to zero. Now, the reason this guy here is a test charge is so that the feel of this charge should not distort the feel of the charge generating the electric feel. So we can therefore see that E will be equal to K Q capital Q over R square R cap divided by small q which will be equal to K Q divided by R square R cap. Therefore the electric field at point P will be equal to K Q R RP R squared R cap Keep in mind that E is equal to F divided by Q imply that F is equal to QE. So, if the charge is free to move, then F is equal to MA, which is equal to QE. So, this implies that A will be equal to Q E divided by M. In other words, dV dt is equal to QE divided by M. Now, if E is constant, then then we will have V equal to V naught plus Q E T all divided by M.
So, if we have several charges, for example, Q1, Q2, Q3, and we want to calculate the fuel at this particular point. Now, in order for you to determine the fuel at a given point P, let's assume we have a small test charge here. If this is positive, this is negative, this is positive, then how will be what will be the total fuel at point P? You see that E1 will be pointing in this direction. This is E1 P. E3 will be pointing in that direction. And E2 will be pointing in this direction. So the total fuel at point P will be equal to E1P plus E2P plus E3P. So generally, E, J is just equal to the summation of I equal to 1 to N, E, I, J, which is going to be equal to the summation of I equal to 1 to N of 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught qi rij squared rij cap so this is the general formula that will give us the electric field at a given point in space In other words, EJ is the summation of E I equal to 1 right up to N of E I J, which will be equal to the sum from I equal to 1 right up to N of K. Q I R I J squared R I J cap. This gives us beautifully the formula to calculate the fuel at a given point in space due to several charges. Let me illustrate this with an example. Let's say we have this is plus Q, plus Q, plus Q, minus Q. And this is a square. And we are to determine the fuel at the center. This is one, two, three, four. Let's imagine that there is a small positive test charge at the center. So if we imagine a small positive test charge at the center, E1 will be in this direction. E2 will be in that direction. Remember, this is negative. E4 will be in this direction. And uh, E3 
will be in that direction. So you see that E2 cancels. This implies that the field will be directed along this direction. What if we have four charges again, plus Q, plus Q, plus Q, plus Q, and we want to determine the field at the center. Let's say this is one, two, three, four. E1 will be directed along this line. E2 will be directed along this line. E3 will be directed along that line. And E4 will be directed along that line. You see that the total electric field in this system is zero. Suppose we have three charges plus Q plus Q plus Q I we want to determine the electric field at the center this is one this is two and this is three you see that E2 will be in that direction E3 will be in that direction and E1 will be in that direction so at a given point in space as long as you know the sign of the charges it is always easier for you to determine the direction and the magnitude of the electric field at that given point Example 1, we will look at a system of three charges, negative Q, plus Q, and plus Q located at a distance A apart along the x-axis, and uh, we are charged with calculating the electric field at a point P located on the positive y-axis a distance A from the origin. So we have a set of three charges. This is point P, a distance A. You have here Q1, Q2, and Q3. Q1 is negative, positive, positive. So assume that, let's imagine that there is a positive charge right there. In what direction will it move due to Q1? Of course, it will be attracted. So this is E1. This will be E2. And this will be E3. Let's say this angle here is theta. This angle here will also be theta. This angle here is theta. This distance, this is A. That is A. So the hypotenuse will be root 2A. 
So we know that E at point P will be equal to E1P plus E2P plus E3P. Now looking at Let's call this angle here alpha. Looking at this diagram, you see that E3 and E1 can be resolved in both the X and the Y direction. But sine of theta is opposite A over the hypotenuse which is root 2 a this is just 1 over root 2 cosine of theta is a divided by root 2 a this is just 1 over root 2 what about alpha sine of alpha is a divided by root 2 a this is just 1 over root 2 similarly the cosine of alpha is a root 2 a and this is just 1 over root 2 as a matter of fact theta is just 45 degrees Celsius sorry degrees there is no Celsius in it um, <clears throat> So, E1 is going to be K Q1 divided by R1 squared, which is just going to be K Q all divided by um, 2A squared. Similarly, E2 will be equal to K Q2 R2 squared which will be equal to K Q divided by A squared so we have E3 equal to K Q3 R3 squared which will be K Q divided by 2A squared so we have here E1 which is KQ over 2A squared E2 which is KQ over A squared so essentially you could see that E1 is equal to E3 in magnitudes and if you observe this if e1 is equal to e3 what does that tell you it means that the y component of e3 will be cancelled out by the y component of E1. So we could do a table if you want. This is the X component, the Y component. E1. E2. E3. And lastly, E.
If you look at E1, you have here negative E1 sine alpha and negative E1 cosine alpha. So this is just going to be negative k q squared divided by 2 root 2 a squared. This is negative k q squared divided by 2 root 2 a squared. Now for e2, we have just one component in the y direction so this is 0 k q over a squared q3 e3 will be negative k q squared over 2 root 2 a squared plus k q squared divided by 2 root 2 a squared. Now to get the, the electric field at point P, we're going to add this and we're going to add this. Clearly, this and this this will give us negative k q squared divided by root 2 a squared and this will give us k q divided by a squared. So this means that E sub p will be equal to k q squared over a squared negative 1 over root 2 i plus 1 o plus j and that will be Newton per coulomb and that will be our answer and that will be our answer Alright, example 2. A small plastic ball of mass M is suspended by a long string of length L in a uniform electric field of magnitude E as shown in the diagram above. If the ball is in equilibrium, when the string makes an angle of phi with the vertical, derive an expression for the net charge on the ball. So we know that that angle is phi. In order for us to do this problem, the very first thing we need to start with is to draw a free body diagram. This angle is phi. We know that the electric field is in that direction. Definitely, we start with the weight. This is mg. The electric force, that is F. And there is a tension in the string, T. There is an electric force. There is weight. So 
so the free body diagram will look somewhat like this this angle right here is fine So you see that we could resolve the tension on the string into two components. This is T sine phi. This is T cosine phi. The system is in equilibrium, meaning that the sum of forces along the x direction is zero, which implies that f minus t, the sine of phi, will be zero. This implies that f is equal to t, the sine of phi. Similarly, the sum of forces in the y direction is zero, which implies that t cosine phi minus mg equal to zero, which means that mg is equal to t cosine of phi. So we know that t will be equal to mg divided by cosine of phi which implies that f will be equal to mg cosine of phi multiplied by sine of phi this will be equal to mg than phi. But what do we know? By definition, E is equal to F divided by Q, which means that F is equal to Q E. Hence, hence Q E will be equal to Mg the tangent of phi, which means that the charge Q will be equal to mg, the tangent of phi, divided by E, and that will give you your answer. That will give you your answer.